Good evening, legends. Welcome to Aussie OCR episode 114. Tonight, I'm talking to Tom Rogers, who just recently in Melbourne placed second in their very first High Rocks event in Australia. And uh, Tom finished fourth in Sydney, moved up the ladder to second, put in a much better performance. I really wanted to bring him on, get an idea of how he trains, how he got to where he is, and hopefully you guys can all learn something. So here he is. I'll bring him on screen. Tom, how are you, mate? Good. Thanks, Matt. How are you doing? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. Thanks for taking the time out of your Wednesday to uh, have a chat with us. And uh, I'm just going to bring some stuff on the screen. How'd you pull up after the weekend, mate? Uh, you're not too bad. The quads and uh, glutes were a bit sore, but um, had a couple of days off and went out for an easy job this morning. So it wasn't too bad, which is good. Nice. Bit, um, bit fatigued, but, yeah. Understandably so, man. It's a, uh, it's a big, big portion of work. Um, and the, the stations are just long enough to sort of wreck you. You know, you, the, the first or second sled push isn't too bad. By the time you get to the fourth, you're like, fuck. Yeah, 100%. And I think those lunges just, just build up in the quads and yeah. by the end of it. And the wall walls <laughs> just wreck. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of work. So we've got a couple of guys jumping on. Um, guys, if you are watching, give us a hashtag live. Give us a hashtag replay. If you are catching a replay later, uh, plenty of guys will be doing that. And um, yeah, look, this is a, it's a live chat, guys. I can, I can bring your comments on screen. Uh, so if you have any questions for Tom, just um, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll just quickly take a quick vid so I can put it up on Insta. People should join us. But um, yeah. mate, how did you, uh, how'd you get into this, dude? How'd you get into Hyrox? Um, do you want the full background of when I sort of got into sport or just the sure. last thing? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So probably growing up, I was always a, a runner. Um, I think back in year two, my dad would take me out on runs. We'd, we'd probably go for a run about 5Ks and I'd just be hanging on for dear life. Um, <laughs> but then sort of took up um, school cross country and had a really good um, cross country coach, Mike Davis, at school. Yeah, nice. We'd um, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings we'd do this thing called mudlarks, where um, the teachers and parents and students could go, and it was a a two k handicapped race, and um, it was awesome because everyone could get involved, and you'd just be chasing down everyone in front of you. Um, oh, so is it like a, a gate, like a timed release? So like these people go then, and then you go thirty seconds later, and then they go thirty seconds later. Yeah, yeah, it's literally yeah, that's so. Cool. Yeah, you're pretty much just chasing everyone. <laughs> That's cool. I've heard yeah. about there, there's a group out in, um, I think it's Griffith, and they run, which is sort of out west of New South Wales, and they run a um, they run a big runners club there that works like that. And I think there's like hundreds of them, and every week there's a guy who like keeps the score and like if you if you finish quicker, you you're like your handicap gets changed and yeah, so everyone like sort of finishes around the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's such a cool what concept. Yeah, it's so good because you're coming down to the last few hundred meters and everyone's there, and it's yeah, it's a good race. Yeah, that's mad. Um, yeah, yeah. So then, um, yeah, I just did cross country through school and um, did a lot of team sports back then. And then probably year nine or ten, I got into triathlons. Oh yeah, um, really? Yeah, and then I spent probably the next eight or ten years doing triathlons. Wow. Um, and then it got to the point where I had to get a full-time job and um, pretty much had to stop that because training three times a day didn't really fit in well with a, a career. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's tough, man. The, the, like what, what distance tries were you doing? Mostly half Ironman distance. Yeah, um, so you're spending a lot of time training. Yeah, yeah, just so many hours on the bike. And um, yeah, it was just so time-consuming. You're always tired. Yeah. Um, eating everything <laughs> yeah every uh every like iron man sort of you know long distance triathlete that i've ever spoken to says that it's the training selfish like you just gotta it's gotta consume you it's gotta be everything and you know often stuff gets pushed to the side like it's got it's such a large chunk of your life yeah that's it were you I know you were talking about doing a, an Ironman at, at some point were you like, i definitely you? will yeah i definitely will i i haven't got it done yet um, 
Yeah, it's definitely something I'll do, man. I, I mean, I've I've been running a long time. I can get on a bike and and go reasonably quick. Um, and you know, I probably get on a bike at least once a week. Um, but the and I, I swam when I was younger, so I played water polo in school. So I, I can swim pretty quick when I want to, but I'm I'm pretty out of training with the swimming. But it's it's sort of like I've been in obstacle course racing for years, and that's you know that's where I. I really enjoy myself I, I love getting out on course but i've sort of done so much stuff there now i've done the enduros i've done the you know i've done the ultras i've i've traveled the world and done a couple of really cool races so i think um the high rocks is a pretty cool i think might be the thing that i might step into next um because there's so much crossover but eventually dude i'll get into some triathlons i think i'm gonna yeah. just start flirting with some shorter ones yeah no fair enough it's yeah. good I found like doing the two Virox events, just the spectators, it's so good because you get to see them the whole race. Yeah, man. Yeah. And that look, that was the biggest thing. I wrote a big um, race report after Sydney and, and, you know, having been in obstacle racing as long as I have, um, it's fucking cool, dude. Like you, you're traveling away to these awesome towns and you're, and you're racing in, in some pretty cool places like Alpine Mountains and stuff. But... Yeah. It's it's difficult, man. Like to to go to say a Spartan Borbo, you know, it's probably a three thousand dollar trip by the time you get down there and you fly down, you hire a car like that. That's if you hotel and and you know you stay down there for a couple of days. Whereas a Hyrox, you can just bounce in. You know, there there were people that did Hyrox Sydney that I've been racing with for years, and I met their family for the first time because they were able to come and watch. It wasn't like the event yeah. wasn't in the middle of fucking nowhere. So it's yeah. it's cool. I've actually got a video to post from um, from Melbourne. It's the fa- my favourite clip that I took of the event, and it was right at the end of your race um, where I was sort of running around the outside with Jackson, and Jackson comes out, and then he goes out of the arena and goes to the other arena, and I like followed him in, and then you just run into the crowd like screaming, and you and you and um, Chris Woolley's on the wall balls. Like it was it was fucking cool, yeah. man. It's yeah, a cool spectator sport. It is. It's awesome. Like just having um all my family and friends like on the sidelines just a few meters away just yeah, yelling at yeah. Just awesome. yeah and that's you know and, and i imagine they they were out to uh support you at iron man and stuff and, and triathletes but it's like there he goes and then an hour later it's like there he goes <laughs> like yeah. you know it's it's because yeah. that's how that's how ocr is as well what was your uh what's who did you have out there because i i Jumped on camera with him a little bit. I, I was talking to your mum, yeah. but there were two other other younger women with her. Yeah, yeah. So I had my mum, Kerry, uh, my partner Bree, um, my youngest brother's girlfriend Sienna, and my nice. dad Greg and my other brother Ben. They were off off somewhere watching on the other side of the arena. I think. Yeah, nice. I think I spoke to your dad in Sydney. I think he was, I was filming yeah. and I said, there, there's an athlete there. I'm not sure who he is. And he goes, that's Tom. He's a triathlete. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, yeah, mate. <laughs> yeah, that would have been him. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's cool, dude. It's cool. I, I think, and I, like I've said this a couple of times in a, in a few places now, I, I see how it's going to do well here because it's, you know, it's it's in a major city. The barrier to entry is very low. Your family can come and watch. You know, if if it's something that you're thinking about doing, you could go and watch it before you before you sign up. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, to go to a Spartan in the middle of nowhere, it's sort of like you're either in or you're not. Um, but it's also it just appeals to that gym market. You know, that that whole segment of people who do F45 and body fit and um, BFT and all those like functional training studios, of which there are many. You know, now they have, you know, that they can train all year and all of a sudden they have a, a performance that they can do. They, they have a competition that they can enter and see where their, where their training measures up. And it might not necessarily be that you train specifically for Hyrox, but once a year you drop in and you do it and you go, oh, I did better than last year, you know. Um, yeah. I think it's a pretty cool benchmark. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think that's what I like about it also is it's such a good balance between cardio and strength. And the movements, they're not, they're not that complex, so anyone can do them. Um, yeah. I know, like, I've always wanted to try CrossFit, but there's just so many complex movements. And if, if mm-hmm. you don't have the, the skills to do the Olympic lifting or the gymnastic movements, you just you won't be competitive. Whereas with this, it's just simple, straightforward fitness, I feel. And, um, yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. 
you're capable. Yeah, you, you bang on exactly right, man. Uh, you know, there, there is that baritantry with CrossFit. If you can't do double unders and climb a rope and do a handstand walk and handstand push-ups, you know, all these really technical skill, heavy Olympic lifts, you can't compete. Um, whereas this, you just have to be able to take an ass whooping. Like, you, yeah. just, you just have to be able to do work. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's cool. Um, we've got a bit of love coming in. So mm. Jared's here live. Uh, Rabina, uh, Rabina, Dominica, that's my partner upstairs. She's saying Rabina try. She's talking me into a triathlon. Um, John Smith saying cardio king. Kerry <laughs> Smith, so proud of you, Tommy. Is that your mum, Kerry? Yeah, it's my mum, yeah. And that's actually, Jared, Jared was down at the event uh, on the weekend. He's one of my mates as well. Oh, so nice. Was, you in there. Yeah. Nice, mate. Um, and then Alice, Tom Rogers, what a weapon. Fastest lunges out there. You work with on the lunges, man. I, um, I said that in the coverage when you were coming through. I said, I think, um, you know, that background, all those hours on the bike, I think just gave you that, that work capacity, that ability to push through that lactic acid. And you, you were quick, man. I, I knew you were quicker than Wally just by watching the speed you were moving. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Matty. Um, I had so much ground to make up on Wally after the, the burpees and the, um, the sleds. So <laughs> the burpees killed me. I, I don't know if it was... Because I can normally do burpees all right, but I think just coming out of the sled, I was just so cooked. It was just yeah. trying to recover. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of like blood shunting too, right? So like you're, you're sort of pushing all your blood into one muscle group and then you're going for a run and then you're pushing all your, mud into, all, all, your, all your blood into another muscle group. And then burpees are always bad because you're down and up, down and up. So it's like fucking your blood pressure up. Like, I don't know if you've run any Spartan races, but it, you know, forever it was like the penalty. If you missed an obstacle, you had to do 30 burpees. And, mm. and you can be fit. Like, you know, the fit guys can bang out 30 burpees in a minute. Um, mm. But if you're 15 Ks into a race and all of a sudden you have to do 30 burpees, it's not a minute. It's like fucking eight minutes. By the time you do, you grind through your burpees and then get your running legs back under you and get your heart rate to stabilize. Like they mess you up, man. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, funny yeah. story. I actually, um, the, the bright, uh, the bright beast in two thousand and nineteen. Oh, you did? Yeah. Um, and I, I hadn't done any any competitive sport since I quit triathlon in um, in two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen. Mm. So I just probably trained three, four months leading up to it, and I did so many burpees for it because I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna have to do burpees for sure. I, I got through all the obstacles and I didn't do a single burpee. And I was like, <laughs> I did all this burpee training and I didn't even get to do any. <laughs> but um, it's yeah. possibly because you did all the burpee training. They're, uh, they're pretty good for you. Yeah. But, um, mate, I, I don't think you're missing anything there, to be honest. Nah. <laughs> Especially if, if you come into like a, you know, say, that, say a back part of a race. Like I, I've run, right? I think I did the, the Ultra in Bright in 2019. And, I usually run burpee free, but if you if you fail an obstacle towards the back end of a race like that, like it can just tax you, and then and then you go straight into the next obstacle, and then you make a, a little error, and then it just turns into a cascade, and all of a yeah. sudden it's you spent thirty minutes doing burpees. Yeah, yeah, it just it's, um, you running, wouldn't it? Yeah, man. Yeah, they 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 break you. They break you, which I think that's why they put them in there. It's just maximum psychological impact. Yeah, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> which is good. But um, I mean, it comes down to having that having that work capacity too, and not many people have it like triathletes. That just mm. ability to ability to keep the hammer down. Um, what do you? What was the 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 weakest point on the um, on the strength side of it? In the event for me, mm. yeah. Um, I know. I think my sled push was um, one of the slowest, but I think yeah, sled push and sled pull were the two that I lost the most ground on. I think. Um, okay. Matt, like, I think I put a lot of time into guys on the sled pull, but guys like Chris Woolley, James Kelly, and that they're they're putting they're going to put a lot of time into me on those, those yeah. movements. Yeah. Um, um, just don't have the, the strength the strength yet to do them. Yeah, I mean, you, you're talking about guys who who are specialising in that, you know, that thing, 
that's that's what they're trying to be good at. Um, Woolley maybe not so much for the last little bit because he's going for the Murph record. Yeah. But um, but he's a fucking savage dude. I mean, James Kelly's obviously just training for High Rocks. So like, if if you're training specifically for that, that's that's what makes something like a Ricky Gerard so impressive when he doesn't even train right. for that and came in and just dominated. Um, yeah, I think if you if you just shift that focus, you, you're going to remember because I, I imagine you you probably had um, stronger legs when you were competing triathlon. Like if you got a, if you got a power up a hill or something, you know yeah. some of those you you turn in a big gear up a hill. It's sort of like a slow push. It's about as, it's about yeah. as much fun. I think um, so. I haven't really done much work on the sleds just because my gym here doesn't have the the best sleds to use. But I think once I do become more used to them i'll i'll be able to do all right at them because yeah as mm-hmm. you said from cycling you do have strong legs yeah uh, yeah the, the body will remember man like once, once you put a bit of time back into it it'll um uh, it'll work itself out yeah it's, it's so, so much easier to get the gains back the second time and and you can spend a long time like i i see that training people who will come to me and say hey matt i used to play fucking footy or something in my 20s and then i had kids and you know, then I stopped playing sport and I got busy with my job and now I'm in my 40s and I've just found this obstacle racing thing and I want to get into it. And like, they'll start training, you put them on a program and just certain parts of their training will just fucking go like this. And you're like, why are you getting, like, why are you improving so much? And you'll ask and it's like, oh, they used to do a certain job or they used to, you know, they were a furniture removalist, they carried shit upstairs for years, but they haven't done it for 15 years, but their body still remembers, like, and, and their leg strength will come back really, really fast. So it's, yeah, yeah. you'll, um, you know, if, if you spend a bit of time focusing on, on, on high rocks specifically, I imagine your body will adapt quite quickly to it, which is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, like even, um, even on, in Melbourne on the weekend, I felt a little bit better on the, the sled pull than I did um, two weeks prior. Um, I did like two or three sled workouts in the, in the two weeks and I think if I have three to six months of proper sled work I should hopefully be able to get a bit closer to the, the guys up front yeah do you know um, I'm just trying to bring your results up actually but the uh, yeah. website's fucking glitching out on me mm. I'm just trying to I'm trying to bring up your Sydney oh here we go because I'm interested, I'm interested to know if I think everyone literally did the same thing in Sydney. Um, that first run loop, you guys went out so fucking hot, yeah. like that. That was quick, man. I think Chris Woolley ran a two forty three on his first run loop. Um, you ran a two forty five, so you weren't far behind for your first K. Like that's that's pretty fucking insane. Um, whereas looking at Melbourne, you guys were like half a minute slower. So, yeah. And, and I could tell just seeing you coming around for like the second loop, I'm like, oh, that pace is not as quick as it was in um, yeah. in Sydney. And then like looking at the timing, everyone seemed to run like a more balanced race. Like instead of it being like fast, fast, slow, 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 and then sort of getting quicker again, it was yeah. like it, it was paced a lot better. So you did time-wise... I think you ran a 104.22 in Sydney and a 101.17. So you said the uh, the sled pull was a bit easier. H- how much do you think that pacing made a difference on how you performed in Melbourne? Um, I think just knowing how the race is, knowing um, just knowing the feeling that you're going to get after the sled and even just a few of the workouts I did like a week out from the race, I think just helped a bit also. We definitely, we definitely did go out a bit harder in um, in Sydney. I think the run was probably a bit shorter in Sydney as well that first run loop. Mm. But I get the feeling um, James Kelly was going out there to to blow a few legs up in that first K there as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think pacing in um, in Melbourne felt a lot better because my run legs in Sydney were absolutely cool. Yeah, it, may, it makes a difference, man. I mean, our um my coach Monique and, and she's sort of shifting out of OCR into hybrid. Um, you know, she ran her first high rocks in Sydney and went out so fucking hot with the girls. And I think she said she set her one K PB time 
in the first K of High Rocks. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the last place you want to set your 1K PB time. But um, on Mons on the Live. But, you know, pacing. So the, the strategy going into um, Melbourne was just run your own race. Like there's going to be some fucking chicks who are just going to take off. And some of them might be better runners than you. Some of them might be running faster than they should. But it doesn't matter. Like you've just got to run your own race because if you run somebody else's race, you're going you're gonna to blow up. Um, and you know, she, she paced it way better and improved like 14 minutes on her time, which was, which was fucking stellar. Um, and, and I sort of saw that across the board with, with all of you guys, like a lot of the guys who were in Sydney, you, you all did like three minutes faster, four minutes yeah. faster on your Sydney times. Yeah. And, and, and that looks like the biggest thing is just that, that first run and, and, and even the next run was slower, like, but everything else looked more level. Yeah, like I think pacing, consistent. Yeah, with this race, pacing such a big thing. Like as soon as you you go super anaerobic, it's like you're going to go anaerobic in the stations anyway. But if you go too deep, you just you just won't be able to recover. And people before the race said to me, "Oh, are you going to try and stick with Wooly? Do you want to try and hang with Wooly?" I'm like, oh, "I'm just going to run my own race. So if I try and stick with Wooly, my race is pretty much be all over." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he um he negative splitted his run. So you guys did like a three twenty, I think he did a three twenty seven. So you must have come into the run pretty much on on top of him. You were the second into the sled, um. But he went out like to give you an idea of pace. So you ran a three twenty seven the first one, a three twenty five on the second loop. I think he ran a three nineteen on the second loop. So he went out and. You know, yeah, went right. significantly quicker on his second run, um, yeah. and then I, th- I yeah. think his next one was like a three thirty. So, you know, he was he was I think the fastest guy, the fastest runner out on course for the day, in, as far yeah. as total total loops, um, and I think he had the fastest loop as well. So, at the end of the day, it's a fucking running race, man. Yeah, hundred um, uh, percent. I was looking at the sled times and I noticed. So I was my sled push. I think was the thirty second quickest. So thirty guys, thirty one guys went quicker than me. But I saw some of your video footage, and you see guys do the sled push, and they're pretty much walking out of the sled. And I think um, I could probably go a bit quicker on the sleds, but I think I'd probably be also walking coming out of the sled as well. So yeah. That kind of balancing the two, really. Yeah, yeah, because they, because I mean that's that's all station time, isn't it? Like walking back yeah. out into the rock zone. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's a it's a dance, man. It's a balancing act of if you go if you push too hard here, it's going to come at the cost of something else. Um, yeah. How do you how have you gone about training specifically for High Rocks um, leading into Sydney? Yeah, um, so I pretty much started training for it probably sixteen weeks before. I think a couple of weeks after they announced the the two event, but. Um, yeah, entered the race and decided to train for them. Um, probably running maybe 50, 50 Ks most weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's usually like a, a threshold run, a long run of about 15 Ks, um, two easy runs, and then a, a compromised running session, usually at the gym. Nice. Um, what's what's yeah. your compromise session look like? Uh, it's sort of varied varied each week um usually six six to seven k's of running um sort of anywhere from 400 meter repeats up to about a k Mm -hmm. and then in between each run i'll do station work um usually three to four minutes of station work in between each run yeah cool and yeah the closer the closer i got to the event i did some pretty much with no rest, but sometimes I'd just do like uh, um, station work, run, station work, a minute rest, um, mm-hmm. time, time six or time eight. Yeah, and then cool. I'd, I'd go like run, station, run, station, run, and then a minute rest. And then sort of as I got closer to the event, it was pretty much 75% or 80% of the race, um, just all, all at once. Yeah, cool. So you're just sort of building building that capacity in segments and then slowly just stitching them together into a larger thing. Yeah, that's it. And then um, I do two other gym sessions. One was just 
um, strength strength focused and a bit of um, hypertrophy work towards the end and then mm -hmm. the other one was a bit of strength work and then I'd finish with like a 30 to 40 minute um, sort of Tabata or AMRAP style workout cool. just like alternate through the stations for yep. 30 to 40 minutes yeah I love um, Tabatas I finish oh. PT sessions all the time with Tabatas especially on the assault bike oh, just brutal. in case the client hasn't sweated enough um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got one client who asks for it. He's a complete fucking masochist. But yeah, Tabatas are great. If anyone doesn't know what a Tabata is, it's a Japanese guy came up with it. I think in the eighties, maybe the nineties, but I might have just made that up. Somebody Google me. Um, it's a, a set, eight sets of uh, twenty seconds on, ten seconds off, and the the idea is you go as hard as you can on that twenty seconds on, and then you got that ten seconds, and it's it's. So popular on like the uh, assault bikes and stuff that I've got the Rogue Echo bike, which is like the CrossFit version, and it actually comes with like a Tabata button. You just hit it and it just goes beep, beep, beep and starts. It's fucking death. Oh, but it's yeah, but they're good. Get hard in. yeah, man. Yeah, um, they're they're actually really good. They did a um, they did somebody did some studies on them where they got they I think they did it with elite cyclists and they got some cyclists in to do like um, a couple of forty five minute sessions each week and the other set of cyclists just did Tabatas a certain yeah. amount of Tabatas each week and they had like really similar gains um, but the Tabata session obviously did a whole lot less work but the nature of it because you're going so intense for that little period um, yeah. you know you, you, you're sort of hijacking gains but yeah yeah sorry just sorry, makes, sorry to interrupt with that no no not at all like it just makes that easier pace feel so much easier or your race pace feels mm -hmm. so much easier yeah, yeah. Yeah, you get used to the suffer, right? Mm. Yeah, that's right. Because you go out and do a fucking high rocks in an hour, man. You're going to suffer. There's well, parts of that that aren't fun. Nah, so much pain. <laughs> I, um, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry. No, 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 you go. I was, I was just going to say, it's funny. It's um, it's The running is so much of a different feeling to the running in triathlon. Like... I can't even hold close to the pace I'm holding in a half Ironman for 21 k's off the bike in a high rocks. Just because I think you go you go so anaerobic in those stations, it's just yeah. a completely different feeling to running in a triathlon. Yeah, man, you you're changing between energy systems as well, which is yeah. which is what you're saying between aerobic and anaerobic. Like, so your your body's having to use different fuels and it's having to work out what the fuck's going on, and and that's something that we do. That's something that I've done with with clients for obstacle racing because it's it's similar, you know. Like you you'll be out running and then you've got to go up a fucking big hill with a sandbag and then you got to run again and then you got to carry something. So they're like, there's a lot of similarities, um, and sometimes that's what we'll sort of focus on is is literally just that transitioning between exercise to exercise, like coming out of the run into that next exercise with as much intensity as you can and and maintaining that that sort of aggression all the way through and i and i think that's something that um james kelly said when i spoke to him is is you know that time in transitions and the time in the rock zone like that's where you win the race is getting yeah. that you know getting your body able to switch between tasks efficiently over time yeah you can lose so much time coming in and out of those stations mm. i saw videos of um james kelly actually i think in sydney and yeah you can see how much he attacks it coming out of that station just picks yeah. up and go away. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't fucking about. Um, I think there was only there was only about twelve seconds or something between um, James's time. Actually, I should be able to get it here between uh, James's time and Chris's time. Yeah, yeah. Right. So a fifty nine eighteen was James Kelly in uh, in Sydney, and mm. um, I think Woolley ran a fifty nine. 27 in yeah. Melbourne, something like that. It'll be um, good to see those boys go head to head once uh, Willie gets back into his full time yeah. horror. Yeah, man, because obviously he's been training for Murph. Um, yeah, he's an animal. So if he, yeah. if he specializes back for Hyrox again, like I reckon he'll, he should be able to take another two minutes off that. Mm. Um, so it should be interesting, man. I, I'm really, I'm really excited for the, uh, 
for the sport. I think it's going to be really cool. And I'll, I'll just grab a couple of comments because uh, Matty Day, who who ran Sydney with you, uh, he ran his first Horrocks there. He's now over in Europe, same life from Prague. Um, John Smith saying sled push. He might have been saying when I said what was the weakest one for you. I think he chimed in there. Uh, Monique saying live um, was our amazing coach I was talking about. Yeah. So Dom just asked, and this is what I was going to say anyway, and I, I think I did ask you on the interview and on the day, but is, is High Rocks going to be the thing that you're you're going to focus on moving forwards? Yeah, 100%. Um, I, haven't, I haven't really had a sporting focus for about yeah, about seven years now since I stopped doing triathlons, and I actually started following um, the sport of High Rocks just, just online, the European and American racing probably... 2020, 2019, and um, mm -hmm. I was always hoping it would come to Australia, but I wasn't sure. I didn't really want to commit to, to traveling overseas. And mm -hmm. when it was announced, um, yeah, sort of five, six months ago, I was stoked. And yeah, now I'm going to commit 100% to it and hopefully next year give it a give it a good crack and hopefully drop a bit of time and see if I can compete with guys like um, Chris Woolley and James Kelly. Well, you're not far off the pace, man. And you, you've obviously got the got the history. You've got the work capacity. You've got the volume in the legs. That's that's the thing too that I think is is the difficult part. Um, strength takes a long time to build, and and volume in legs, like being able to go out and do six hours of work, like being able to go out and do that takes takes time. So, I mean, you've already got that in your background. So, how how old are you, Tommy? I'm thirty. 30 so you're just probably just hitting your peak in in this sort of style of exercise yeah that's it there's a lot of a lot of guys i think are in there sort of around their mid-30s who are you know dominating this yeah yeah i think tom hogan he might even be 42 or 40 i think he he did a similar time to, to james kelly he was in the elite 15 um last year so yeah it's definitely like an endurance sport yeah yeah, and I, I think part of that is because it takes so long to build that volume. And I, I think like triathlons are same, like you can come in and peak. You know, you've got guys in their 30s who are who are doing really well. Every now and again, you'll get a guy in their 20s who's a fucking savage. But yeah. um, but I think it's 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 not as like perishable as a, as a skill like um, soccer or football or fucking mixed martial arts or something like that, where it's it's based on a lot of agility and... And, and, and power like you're just getting out there and, and doing work yeah and you, you, can, you can maintain that and and also your I think as you get older and I've said this before as you get older you get better at just tolerating suffering I think you you get this reference point for like I've been here before I've suffered before I got through that I can get through this like when you're when you're a bit younger you're not quite as resilient um, yeah, and and it's it's because you haven't had as many fucked workouts that you've done, but also you haven't had as much shit happen to you in life. You know, you you're not, you know, you haven't had friends die, you haven't had bad relationships, you haven't been bankrupt once or twice. Like it's it's <laughs> you know, life's better, and and where, as you get a bit older and you've had some shit happen to you, I think your ability to tolerate discomfort is better, and therefore you can go out and run for fucking ten hours if you so choose. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, like as you get older, I think like you realise the sacrifices you're making for sport, like friends, family, work, and um, when you're in that time of pain during the race, you just think about that. And it helps you push through it that a uh, little bit more. Whereas when you're younger, you're just free and happy, and you're just doing whatever, and it doesn't really matter, and is what it is. Whereas yeah, it's different when you're older. So, what is what is that why, man? Like when when you're out there and you are you are grinding, what are you what's what are you telling yourself in your head? What's the thing that's keeping you on that pace? Because it fucking hurts, man. It hurts to go as hard as you guys. Are, it hurts to go as hard as like it hurts to redline no matter who you are or how fast you are. But you guys yeah. are going pretty hard. So what what's is there something that you've got on loop in your head? Are you are you trying to be the best? Like what's what's happening? I think it's just wanting to be to beat people and just to just competitive to improve myself but also just to beat the other guys I think it's just that competitive spirit I don't know it's just yeah, yeah. I want to beat the other guys just want to yeah have a crack and um, that's pretty much all you're thinking about for most of the race yeah that's um that's cool man I 
Because not everyone has that. Not everyone has that that competitive drive. Um, mm. And I, I think the people who do have it end up being athletes or, or end up in certain jobs that, that you know, that serves them well. I, uh, I, I'm the same, man. I, I love to compete. And I'll often go to the gym and train with guys and they'll beat me in workouts at the gym. But then on race day, I'm just... I'm like, catch me if you can, motherfucker. Like a, sw- a, a switch just flicks. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, some, there's something in there. But it's... Yeah. um, Did that... So was that always the case? Like when you were when you were going through triathlon, was it was it just a, a will to win? Like how, how have you... How has your mindset evolved as you've sort of gone out of that sport, you know, maybe taken a bit of time off and now you're back at it? Um, yeah, it was similar to that then as well. And I think also just wanting to prove myself... Um, like I always would tell myself I'm as good as these guys and um, like I'd eventually get the chance to have a crack at some of them and during the race you'd be in all sorts of pain and you'd be like, mate, like everyone's going through this. Like this is what this is what champions are made of. Like you just got to keep pushing through. Don't be weak basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably the other thing for the, the High Rocks event was actually um, – emailed Hyrox Rocks Australia and asked to be in the, the first wave. <laughs> oh, yeah? Said, yeah, yeah, I basically said, um, oh, like, I really think I, I can compete with the top guys um, sort of thing. Like, not, not being arrogant or anything. I was just like, I'd love to race the top guys. I think I can yeah. be competitive. And during the race, I'm obviously like, well, you can't, you can't be a little bitch about it now because you've already told these guys you're going to be <laughs> you gotta, you got to back it up. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, that's a uh, yeah. it's a method for accountability, right? Um, yeah, you know, if I, if I've got somebody who's who's like, oh, I want to get better at running, it's like, cool, let's sign up for a race, sign up for a race in fucking twelve weeks, and put a social media up, put put a social media post up, and tell people that you're doing it, because now you got skin in the game, mm. and you know now your now your reputation is on the line, and it's not on the fucking line, but you think it is personally, so it makes you drive harder. You know, you're like. You're on show. I mean, I imagine, and I've always said during obstacle races, whenever you see a camera, you just fucking feel a bit better. You feel, you pep up a bit, you, your stride improves a little bit. You know, it doesn't matter how tired you are. It doesn't matter how tired you are when you're coming into the finish line, all of a sudden you look like you did at the start of the race. Um, yeah. You know, if they just put fucking cameras all the way along the course, I'd run yeah. faster. And that's sort of what High Rocks is, man. There's just eyes on you. There's nowhere to hide. There's nah. people watching you the whole fucking time. I see, I see you at every corner. Oh, here comes that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, here we go. We got to push the way now. <laughs> Mate, I've I've been working on my uh, my tech loadout. I think next time I'm gonna set myself up so I can actually run a loop or two with you. It's probably in the back of the race when you slow down a bit. But <laughs> don't have anything yeah. on four minute four minute k's. <laughs> yeah, that first loop uh, when Willie takes it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can keep that. Yeah, that's it. But yeah, it's it's fun, man, and it's 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 cool to watch athletes fucking throw down, and and it's cool for the for everyone in there. It's cool for the beginners. It's cool for the the family. It's cool for the elite guys to see other elites, and then you you learn what they're doing. It's, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, no, I think it's awesome. Um, I followed yeah guys like Chris Woolley and James Kelly, and yeah, probably started following Chris Woolley back in. Um, 2019 when I did that uh, Spartan race and it was just mm. cool racing alongside him um, yeah. on the weekend and two weeks before prior to that and same with Sydney with um, guys like uh, yeah James Kelly and James Newbury yeah awesome yeah yeah there's been some uh, some pretty amazing athletes that have that have come in so far which is which is really cool um, so Johnny saying that Tommy said he'll do the war balls unbroken next race you're gonna pull a Ricky Gerard nah he's He's all talk that John Smith bloke. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's who's John? That's my brother. That's my brother. Oh, yeah. nice. Come to smack talk your brother. Yeah. Right. You just have to get him out on a course, and then he can smack yeah, talk right. you as much as he likes. I've been trying to get him out, so uh, I think he promised actually he'll commit to the next one uh, next year. Isn't that Do right? doubles with him. Yeah, that'd be all right. I reckon uh, the doubles would be. A different kind of pain to be honest yeah well it, it is man it is you know someone will say to me what's harder a, a spartan 21k or a 5k and i'm like 
it's fucking different, man. Because like at 21, you just you're not nearly pushing as hard, but you're going longer. But a 5k is like you are fucking redlined the whole time. So I would say in a like when you were talking about the workouts you were doing, where you'd like go for a run, then you'd do a bit of station work, then a minute rest, and then a bit of station work, a minute rest, like. If you've got a, a workout structured like that, you're able to to hit your stations harder than you would in a complete workout. Yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't make them easier because you you're sort of finding that extra gear, and I'd say that's more like what a doubles would be. Um, and looking at the time, like James Newbury, I'll see if I can bring this up because James Newbury ran a. Um, he ran a 104.36 in, yep. um, in Sydney. He did the doubles with um, with a guy called Ryan Weckert, which is a fucking monster, amazing yeah. athlete. Um, and I think they did a 53 or maybe a 54. Yeah. It's... So they're... <sighs> you just get that recovery. I can't believe um, they got beaten, actually. I saw some guys beat them and went 51. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I think somebody yeah. had him by about a minute and a half. They came third. I'm, I'm just just about to have a race report come out tomorrow, so I was looking at all the scores today. But yeah, it's um, it's pretty fucking savage. Yeah, well, I actually remember seeing Ryan um, in Sydney, and uh, he was a weapon on the stations. I just remember every station we did, he would just tear off past us, and then. We catch him on the run, but every time we got to a station, <laughs> it was just ridiculous. Yeah. I think he had the fastest sled time. You know? Wouldn't surprise me. He's a fucking monster. Yeah. Um, he's a monster. I'll see, I'll see if I can find him, actually, just for people watching, because it's... Um, he's a big dude. Yeah. He's a big dude. Where would I go? Maybe James Newbury. So this uh, software that I use is cool, because I can bring things up on screen and then we can get a look at these fucking superhumans <laughs> so that's uh james and ryan he's a big boy animals it just says he he was laughing the whole time casually rowing a 123 pace yeah which is fucking crazy i think 123 is my pb for 500 meters <laughs> that is quick yeah they're fucking big boys but but that's a different thing right so Mm. that's where like the the cool thing about about this is you've got all these different athletes from like different disciplines and they all have different strengths and weaknesses and then you sort of see where it all plugs together it's sort of like it, it was interesting and i was talking to somebody about this today about um what happened in sydney and, yeah. and why it went out so fast and i think it's because nobody knew where the benchmark was so it just yeah. went and everyone was like and they're like, he's in front. I've got to fucking keep up with him. Like nobody knew who was running. Like nobody knew how to run their own race. They're all just like, we got to go as hard as we can. Whereas in yeah. Melbourne, everyone just sort of paced it a bit better. Um, but you, you'll sort of see somebody come in and they'll smash the road. They'll smash all the erg work, but they can't do a sled or they'll fucking smash the sleds, but they can't do burpees. And But you see these position changes and they all sort of come into the finish line around the same time. It's it's really fucking cool. It reminds me of like UFC in the early days where like, yeah. they're like, we're going to put this karate master versus this sumo wrestler and who knows what the fuck's going to happen. And, <laughs> you know, spoiler, spoiler alert, the sumo always gets fucked up. But um, but it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Like, it's sort of like the Wild West. Nobody, at least here, I mean, overseas, they've, they've had it for a while. But here you've got all these guys who maybe haven't even heard of it having a crack and nobody knows how to pace themselves and it's it's no. people just throwing throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks it's fucking mad yeah yeah i was uh, surprised I, sorry yeah sorry yeah i was gonna say i was surprised at how many how many guys came in uh, in that first k just in a big group i was like there's gonna be some explosions here yeah and guys um, did and in melbourne yeah it was completely different most people held back a bit more yeah, but even still, you had guys blow up because um, you've got you've got the CrossFitters man who come in and they, you know, they're fucking savages for twenty minutes. Yeah, but yeah. it's not a twenty minute race. So nah. you got to like the 40, 45 minutes in, and they're just they're just starting. They just, I, I find they just they're not specialized for the runs. 
So yeah. they start to fade off that pace a little bit later where that's where, you, you know, you guys who have got that, that work capacity in the legs can just keep that hammer down on the runs. Like, you you know, I think you were still running. Let's bring this up, Melbourne. So you ran a 327 for your first, 325 for your second. So you actually negative splitted yours as well, uh, which is pretty cool. Was yeah. This, the first K is a tiny bit longer because the start... Yeah. Yeah, in Melbourne, because the start's a little bit further back. Okay. Just around the corner. Was that the same in Sydney? Sydney Sydney was the opposite. Sydney was shorter, the first K. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So um, I think this are supposed to do it so that all, all of them add up to 8K. That's what I'm hearing. But, That's what I'm hearing, but <laughs> I'm also hearing that they don't always manage that. But it's too early for me to be criticising anything. I'm just happy it's here. Yeah, same. Um, but yeah, you ran a 327, a 325, a 349, a 343, a 346, a 341, a 341, a 443. But your 443 is obviously after your lunges, which are fucked. Um, and you, you, know, you were the fastest on the lunges for the day. And you ran the second best run lap and you ran the third best run total. So if anyone hasn't seen these um, these analytics, they're fucking amazing. Like you can see everything. You can see what time you came into the obstacles, how much time you had in rock zone, how much time you had in each obstacle, where you measured up, like you were, you know, as you said, 32nd overall in the sled push. You actually did pretty well in the pool. Um, you picked up a couple of positions there. Um, the yeah. burpees, you know, a, a lot of people said to me, the burpees is where the race starts. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, this, um, this fucking data man is, is awesome for me as, as a, as an athlete and as an athlete who's always had data, I've always had chest straps, I've always had watches of, of all, and I imagine coming out of triathlete, you'd be the same. People are either yeah. data heavy or they're complete purists and they wear nothing. Um, you know, for me, as an athlete who likes data, this is amazing. But as a coach, this is a fucking gold mine, man. Like just right. being able to look at where people's splits are and what where they match up. And, you know, you can literally go, well, you, if we can get your burpees and your sled push up, you'd win the fucking race, you know? Obviously, yeah. it's not that easy, but it's... Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but it's, and it's good because you can... Yeah, you can click on um, like the sled push, for example, and it just gives you a list of everyone's sled push time and shows you how, how far down you were. You can yeah. choose any, any part of the race to look at. Yeah, it's fucking cool. It's fucking cool. Oh, you won your age group. Nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 30 to 34. Well, that's mm. good because I'm, uh, I'm in 35 to 39, so at least I don't have to worry about you for a few years. Perhaps never. Could we, what you are you, go. 30? I'm 35. Yeah. So I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think I'll ever be on an age cap podium with you, mate. You got um Chris Woolley. Chris Woolley's in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's not better. Um, no. But yeah, the, the data the data's sick, man. It's um, it's cool. Katie Smith saying go, Tommy. I think all the Smiths are on tonight. <laughs> that's our family sister. <laughs> nice. Um, Matty Day, who is he was the one who uh, commented before. He's live over in Prague. Um, Thanks, Matty, for these interviews. Great to see new faces and hearing different backgrounds coming into this sport. I'll be coming for you, Tom, in the 30 of 34. Got one year of dedicated training for August next year. Yeah, so Matty <laughs> Day's a good obstacle racer. Um, he actually came with us to um, Spartan Phuket last year and won his um, age cap for Asia Pacific in Spartan. So he's a, he's a pretty handy racer. But then that comes down to the... Um, to where you specialised, right? He's a he's a bit of a smaller frame. He can run up hills all fucking day, you know, a great runner. But the heavier stuff, you know, buckled him a little bit. You know, some of the athletes probably had 10 kilos on him. Yeah. Makes, yeah, makes a big it, difference. It does. Well, I feel like I was one of the, the smallest blokes there, to be honest. <laughs> you, kind of um, you maybe weren't as, like, bulky, but mm. you're tall. So yeah. I think that helps you for like a push because you can like leverage that that height, but yeah. the push you're at a disadvantage. I think. 
Yeah, yeah, true. Um, um, yeah, well, Maddie, I uh, look forward to, to racing you next year and uh, bring on the next 12 months of training. He's, uh, he's a good dude. He's a really good dude. Um, he's fun. He's a raven fucking lunatic, but so am I. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, um, what's happening um, on the Spartan racing scene next year? Very much... Much going on? Not yet. They've got um, <clears throat> Spartans got Picton in a couple of weeks. Picton yeah. being west of um, Sydney, southwest of Sydney. They've got Fiji in uh, November. They haven't released their calendar yet. I I would say at a guess they'll probably release their calendar just after Picton. Yeah. Okay. If I had to guess, um, but I'm not sure. But um. Yeah, should should be a really interesting year for 2020, 2024. Mm. I think um, I think, uh, and anything I say about Spartan is is me thinking things. It's not unless Spartan it comes out of Spartan. It's not. It's just a rumor. Um, I think Fiji will be multiple times, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, it's cool. It's cool. I'm I'm looking forward to. Somebody bringing Decker over. Oh, I've been I've been waiting for that since 2019, to be honest. <laughs> or mm-hmm. whenever when did it start? Decker it was. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not quite back then. But yeah, maybe. Yeah, cool. Oh, yeah, probably cool. 2019 because I think they had a little bit going before, um, before COVID. Mm-hmm. Decker fit. That's not what I fucking googled. Home Decker fit. Let's have a look. Yeah. Google will tell us everything. Um, Decker. So Decker is a uh, is an event in the functional fitness space. So sort of similar to High Rocks. Um, they've got a couple of different races: Decker Strong, Decker Mile, Decker Fit, and uh, it's started by a guy called Yancey Culp, which is a uh, like a veteran OCR guy. Um, coach, athlete, really, really good bloke from every account that I've ever had of him. Apparently, he's a he's a great dude. Yeah, right. um, but I've not met the guy. Mm. Um, I'm trying to fucking find it on their website. I'll bring it on screen. This is riveting. Watching guys, Matt, use Google. When I it would be really good um, for Aussie athletes if they did bring it over. Just, just. To mix it up between High Rocks and Decker Fit and then Spartan, like athletes will just be able to transition between the three much. Yeah, have more to train for, I reckon, throughout the year. Yeah, I, I think you, you're right in that. I think if the market is too small, like if there's just one High Rocks, I don't think people have enough to go. I'm just going to focus on that. It's just something people turn up to as like a, a second thing. But if you've got High Rocks in multiple cities and then you've got Decker in multiple cities, and then you've got maybe another one or two like a Bay Games, and I think the um, Under Armour Combines happening in uh, start of November. I just heard about, or, or the end of October. Um, you know, once you get a couple of sports like that, then there's enough. Like there's a roster where athletes can do it. Like the the interesting thing in Australia was we just didn't have enough races for for there to be like just serious OCR athletes. Um, yeah. You know, they they were growing. They were growing. I think twenty nineteen they had seven events on their calendar, um, yeah. and then or sorry, I think they had about five on their calendar in twenty nineteen. Twenty twenty their calendar was released with I think seven events in total. So that was like seven locations, um, yeah. and then COVID obviously came in and you know slipped the finger into the bum of that, but. Um, you know, then Spartan recovered with, I think they had three full events last year. This year they've had four. So they're sort of starting to grow back. But, you know, the market is sort of so small that I don't think they're in competition. Like, I don't think Spartan and True Grit are in competition. I don't think True Grit is in competition with Raw Challenge. I think people can go to all of them. Whereas yeah. when you go over to, like, the States and the amount of events they've got over there, so I'll bring this back on. When you go over to the States and the amount of events they've got on over there, they've got like multiple stadium races a month, 
which is just the Spartan stadium race. You know, there's guys who were just doing those. Like they were fucking like professional stadium athletes. Um, whereas we've had like two stadiums in Australia in total. I think we had one in 2015 and, and then we had Marvel Stadium in 2020, which was the last um, Spartan race in 2020. Yeah. So yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I think you're right. I think if it's just Hyrox, I think there's plenty of room for say Decker to come over and, and yeah. get people excited about multiple things. And then, and then if there's enough things to train for, then you go, you've got people who, it becomes viable to be an athlete just in that sport. Yeah. In the hybrid racing sport. Yeah. Um, and I think I saw a podcast somewhere um, where they're talking, I think next year there's going to be high rocks, potentially high rocks in um, Brisbane maybe. And I think they were looking at Perth potentially as well. Yeah. That might've been me with um, Matty Locke. Um, yeah. I, Matt said they're, they're pretty good chance of um, Brisbane, well, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne next year um i think they were just trying to find a venue for brisbane and then they he said there's gonna be a fourth one that they're trying to lock in as well but obviously it's it's you know strict requirements on venues it's not just something they can sort of put up anywhere um i think they would they were looking at new zealand but they literally can't find a fucking shed big enough so there's got to be some fucking farmer over there that's just got ten thousand sheep in a fucking shed i'm gonna just take him out of there for the day mate let us come in that's right. Um, but, well, I wonder if they'd ever do it like in an outdoor, like like at an athletics track or anything like that. I reckon that'd be pretty cool. Uh, I, I think I think the issue there then becomes the quality control aspect because now yeah, you've yeah. got the weather. Like that's and that's a cool thing about OCR, right? You can go to an event in uh, like in fucking bright in in Borbor at the start of the year, right? So Borbor is a it was an alpine mountain in uh, Victoria. So Victorian snowfields, and um, it was in February, man. So it could yeah. have been forty-five fucking degrees, or yeah. it could, but instead it was like snowing the week before. Jeez. It was fucking freezing, man. Like, <laughs> so you, you don't know what you're gonna get. Like, and it, like the difference of training for a 40, 40 degree. Right? Like I did the ultra there, um, and. You know, it was freezing. It was like two degrees. I did, I did it in speedos, so I had to take my pants off before the race, and we're just fucking sitting there like, fuck, it's cold. Um, but the difference of training for like a fifty k race on a on an alpine mountain, if it's going to be forty degrees compared to if it's going to be two degrees, yeah. it's a huge variable. So, like, imagine if you're doing a a high rocks, which is like standardized, no matter where you go, and you do one race and it's 35 degrees and hot and the next race it's 15 degrees and raining yeah it's completely like, different yeah like there's an uproar at the moment about the sleds being too fast imagine the uproar if it's like my right it was fucking hailing during my race you know uh, <laughs> yeah i don't know what they're gonna do about the sleds because yeah there's a lot of talk about it isn't there oh, yeah i don't know man i i spoke to um i spoke to Wooly about it i i was i was you know i saw a post that um a hybrid racing media put up about it and, the, and they were talking about you know there's no way the guys got that faster on the sled and there's no way they improved that fast over the course like obviously the course was faster and i'm like man have you guys never fucking blown up before have you guys never gone out too fast at the start of a run I, I do it way more often than i should um and it fucks you up like if you look at how much faster that first run loop was and then just look at the the splits for the rest of the race in sydney compared to like what it was in melbourne Everyone started a bit more sedate and and managed to keep their runs consistent, whereas in yeah. Sydney it was fucking all over the place. Like, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. There, there's a bit of talk about it that it was the sleds and yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure I had the same the same sled push time in in Melbourne as I did in Sydney, and then my sled pull was maybe twenty or thirty seconds quicker, I think. Yeah. But I think that was just knowing how to pull the sled I think a bit better than I did in Sydney yeah I think I saw you with a pretty good technique I might um hold on I'll see if I can bring your that little um that little highlight video that I did I should be able to bring it on sorry guys stay tuned I'm just gonna use Google again um alright so what I'll do, if I click this, I think it's going to try and... 
Okay, I've muted the sound. All right. So, so that being the side push. Having a rest. Didn't, didn't look like you were enjoying yourself too much. No, nah, it wasn't. <laughs> Yeah, so you there you were sort of just walking it back. Yeah. But that's where I was saying you're sort of using your height to your advantage because you you sort of um there's Kerry. You sort of um slumped like right over and then stood up with it. So like you're yeah. glued, you're using like all of your leverage instead yeah. of like trying to fucking strong arm the thing. Yeah, I think um in Sydney, I did a similar technique, but I think I just used my arms a lot more and just wasted way too much energy. Yeah, I mean, that that was one thing that I, I was um, coaching one of my clients with, um, just watching the sled and how they were doing it. And I said, just let your glute do the work. Like, it's the biggest muscle in your body. Save, save the arms if you can. Yeah, and, that's and, it. And they, and they knocked like two minutes off their sled pull. Yeah, well, so it's, that's um, it. Yeah, but also the pacing. Um, it's it's yeah. a it's a big thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we're gonna see you at uh, one next year. Yeah, definitely, dude. Def- man, I was fucking chomping at the bit. I, I was actually signed up for um, for the pro in Sydney, and I've had um, I've had some I've had a shoulder that's been niggling since like twenty nineteen. Um, I went and did a, a twelve hour hurricane heat and trifecta in Hawaii and um, it was brutal and I remember getting a scan then and had issues with it like a bit of bursitis and stuff and then just I think I sort of rehabbed it to a point where it was good and then I'd do another big savage race and then I'm like oh that shoulder's fucked again and then I'd rehab it and I'm like oh it's it's okay and then I'm back into like Muay Thai training or whatever it is I'm doing and it's just over time it just got worse and worse like I think for five years I've sort of done something every month you know, and I'm always doing dumb shit. Like I'll, I'll carry, last year I carried a, a log through the 12, the 24 hour enduro. So like a 42 kilo log. And I took it through all the obstacles and left at like two in the morning with it. And it took me seven hours and I had to like rope it up fucking cargo nets and shit. Um, you know, so I just, I've just done stuff like that, that I've just worn my body down, but I finally got to a point where it was like starting to lock up on me, and I'm like, ah, oh, I better, I better do something about this. So I went and got it imaged, and um, yeah, I've got a, a torn labrum, a torn ligament, um, arthritis in the shoulder. I was, I was aware of the arthritis, but it just got to a point where it was like, if I don't, if I don't take some time off, like take my foot off the gas and fix it, um, I'm going to damage it properly, and like I'm not going to be able to fix it. So I'm sort of at the point where if I keep going, I'm going to need surgery, whereas now I can probably get on top of it. So I actually had some PRP today. Uh, I've got another one in four weeks. And I, I that's the second PRP treatment that I've had. And it, it responded pretty well the first time. Um, so the doctor reckons sort of three or four, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of see some some uh, some improvement out of it. But yeah, just taking, taking a bit of time to fix it, make sure it's right. Especially now, like I've, I've always been... Like I've always loved OCR. I'm not super competitive. Like I'm a bit bigger, I'm a bit stronger. Um, you know, I can get out there and run on, a, on my best day, I might top 10 something. Um, but now that I've seen High Rocks, I'm like, oh fuck, this this could be a sport that I'm actually, so like could be pretty good at. So yeah. now it's more important to fix the shoulder. Um, yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, I really like running the media. Well, that's what I was going to say. It'd be a shame to not see you doing the media at the next one. (laughs) Yeah, so I'm just trying to work out how to balance it. And I actually, so I I, I pulled out of the pro in Sydney. um, And then in the two weeks in the middle, well, after Sydney, I was like, fuck, I think I should go to Melbourne and film it because like it was was pretty cool. And I just just really want to get involved in this. Like I want to, I think this is going to be massive. Um, so I was trying to source an open ticket for uh, Melbourne and I actually found one and I found one the Friday. So like the weekend before on the Friday, I was like, yeah, look, dude, if you want it, you can have it. Here it is. This is what it'll cost. And I'm like, look, I'm going to do a workout on Sunday 
and I'm just going to put it through its fucking paces. And if I have issues with the workout, I'm not going to do high rocks. And um, yeah, I, did, I got halfway through the workout and it was, it was locking up and I'm like, nah, it's a stupid idea. So I'll just have FOMO and film. Yeah, yeah, so cool. I, think, I think it was a better choice. But to answer your question in a long way, um, I think I'll be having a good crack in uh, 2024. Yeah. I think I'll try to maybe pick one event that I'm not going to run the media at or see if I can get somebody else to at least film some highlights for me. So even if I'm not commentating, I can still do some highlight videos. But um, yeah. yeah, dude, I think it's it looks fucking fun. Yeah. And it's it's okay. right up it's right in my wheelhouse just going out and suffering. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It was um it was great having you on the media. I think it just helps promote the sport and promote all the athletes so much I hope more. So. Makes it really good for the spectators and family and friends and that as well, I think. Like Yeah, I mean I hope so, you know. And it's something I've been trying to do with, with obstacle course racing for the last couple of years. And it's I think I sort of had the right idea, but the wrong sport. I think it just doesn't work when you're up a Alpine mountain and there's no reception and I can't upload anything to your fucking Instagram and, you know, the athletes. It's sort of like if I was trying to do this in triathlon. Yeah. It'd be like, and they're off. And they'll be back in like an hour. Unless yeah. I can get out there in a car or something or on a, or I'm on a motorbike. Like I've done I've done live streaming at um, Raw Challenge at Gold, in the Gold Coast, which is a fantastic fucking race and I do a bit of stuff out there. But we'll like jump on a buggy or jump on a motorbike or a quad bike or something. And I'll jump on the back of the quad and film and commentate as we go and then stick with the guys at the front. So that's cool. But if you can't if you can't get there and do that or if there's no reception, like the whole thing just falls apart. Whereas High Rocks, man, I, it's 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 a it's a spectator sport. And I dare say like in a sport like this, a lot of these athletes have probably never seen themselves like you, you know, you guys have probably never seen yourself on camera like that in like a 50 minute video. No, nah, not at all. Cause unless you're on something that's on TV. Yeah. And yeah, you had so much footage. Like I watched your, your reel of like the whole race and it just, it gives you a picture of like all the, the top sort of guys and girls and it just shows you what's going on in the event. It's just awesome. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's not like they're not doing it either. Like they, they did their own live stream, but I think it's a different thing. I think if you're just running a live stream just at the front and there's no commentary, it's just a camera on. Like you're seeing the guy at the front win the race, yeah. but I think um, I try to give it as much context as I can. I try and explain to things for people who maybe are watching and they don't, they, they don't do the sport themselves or they don't have a background in fitness or, you know, understanding energy systems and fatigue in legs and stuff like that. And, um, yeah. And then just trying to be where like the action is as opposed to the guy who's winning the race. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. No, you no, know, like, no. I'm glad, glad it landed, man. I'm glad people were enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And um, yeah, you, cause you know, a lot of the athletes, it's also good cause you can talk about them, talk about their strengths and weaknesses and yeah. talk about what's going on in the race, which is, yeah, I just found really interesting, I reckon. Yeah, and, and sometimes smack talk them during the race, uh, which is fun too. 100%. Um, <laughs> bit of banter. There's some guys who love it. There's some guys who don't at all. Yeah. I saw uh, um, Jackson was giving it back to you on uh, on some parts of it when you were filming him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He day too because I was like talking as he's coming in and he's like, you're so fucking distracting. And I'm just laughing. <laughs> he's, he's he's a good dude, man. He's, he's like yeah. a fucking showman. Yeah. So it's just it's just interesting the personalities and stuff that you get in in a high level sport yeah because they're all such yeah. driven people yeah and it's I think it's good there's um athletes from so many different sports coming together as well like mm -hmm. you got crossfitters like high rock specialists triathletes runners um just people who just love to get fit at the gym as well so mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what happens in um in 12 months time I reckon yeah. What do you think, um, if you had to guess, so let's say hypothetically it's Sydney, Melbourne, Queensland, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane next year. If you had to guess, where's, where's the fourth event? Uh, either Adelaide or Perth. I'm guessing yeah, maybe. I agree. I agree. I, I'd say it's Perth if I had to guess. Yeah. I, I was sort of thinking about it and I'm like, I wonder how much of the gear 
Like they're obviously bumping in and bumping out all their signage and, and all that stuff. But I wonder how much of like the fencing they hire. I wonder how much of the um, things like the, like I know it's their sleds. Um, I think it's BFT's weights. So do they get weights off the gyms or do they move all the weights around? Um, you know, the kettlebells they'd move around, but things like the, the ski ergs and the rowers, do they just hire them? Yeah, I don't know. Because it'd be a lot easier if they hired them. Mm. And I wonder, they must use the same password at, at each of the events. I wonder, like... The, they, they must use the same what, sorry? The, the carpet for the... Um, oh, yeah. For the yeah. I assume as that gets more worn, maybe that's that's why the clothes become slower. That's what... Yeah, I, I think that's probably the case. I think, like, you've got uh, mm. brand new sleds and they're, like, just been powder-coated and they're slippery as fuck. Like, and the yeah. carpet's brand new and it's fluffy. Like, But once it wears down a bit and then those sleds have been moved, pulled in and out of containers and they're scuffed up a bit on the bottom, yeah, it's going to be more friction. So I, I think, like, the idea that brand-new carpet, brand-new sleds are always going to be a little bit slippier. Um, yeah. it'd be interesting it'd be interesting um, yeah. what what have you got have you got anything in your sites because obviously we haven't got a, a Hyrox calendar I don't think like we're not going to get anything until next year um, out of, out yeah. of Hyrox Australia have you got anything in your sites for the next well I'm actually uh, I'm potentially going to go over to Hong Kong in November 26th of November um, yeah. this year just because I want to I just want to get more experience and see if I can change my training up a bit and see if um, see if it helps. So then, yeah, just the more experience I can get and the more I can figure out my training, um, the better for next year, I figure. Mad. Mad. And then, Hong Kong will be fun. Yeah, yeah, it'll be good to... It's pretty much like a puzzle just figuring out the best way to train for, for something like this, I think. Um, yeah, mate, happy to bounce ideas if you ever want to chat. Um, yeah. I think what what date did you say that was Hong Kong? The twenty sixth of November. Uh, I'll be in um, Thailand. That'll be APAC. That'll be oh, APAC yeah. in Phuket, which will yeah, we'll right. be taking people over there. Um, I think I saw an array, a race. I think it was late September in uh, Singapore for High Rocks. So I might try and get over there and do some media. Yeah, um, so, I'd one. yeah. I think that's could be pretty cool. Mm. And then. Um, there's another one in Hong Kong in May next year, I think. That's the qualifier, right? That's the qualifier for the Elite 15. Um, potentially, yeah, mate, I'll see, how, um, I'll see how I go in Hong Kong in November and then uh, if I think I can get fit enough to have a crack at it, maybe go back over in uh, May and uh, yeah. see if we can have a crack. I'll, uh, I'll, definitely, I'll definitely make that one. Yeah. That'd be sick. Cool. I think yeah. Woolley said he was going in one of the interviews you did with him i think yeah yeah he and said he was going hard he's, he's going to get his murph record i think he's i think he's five weeks out from that i was speaking to him today um yeah i think he's gonna he's gonna go hard for his murph and then it'll just all be horrocks after that and he's, he's, he's a straight up savage so he should be in fighting shape for may yeah. um so dom's saying Deca malaysia is the closest so maybe that's the closest franchise at this point. Um, Monique's saying I'm going to suss out gyms to bring Decker. Yeah, let's chat more about that, Mon. Yeah, so Mon also saying the machines are interesting because they need to be calibrated the same. CrossFit Games had an issue with their treadmills on one of the events because some of them weren't calibrated properly. So yeah, I mean, quality control is always going to be a thing. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're bouncing fucking rollers and shit around in shipping containers and on trucks and putting them on trains, like you have the same issue, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Giving so the machines were giving people slower and faster times. I've definitely been on treadmills that were faster than other treadmills. Like, yeah, they can run on a treadmill. And you're like, what the fuck? This thing's out of control, yeah. and it's saying I'm running like 11 k's an hour. I reckon um, older rowers definitely know they feel they feel slower. I don't know if it's just the machine, like all the chain, and that's all stretched and could be. I feel like the newer the newer machines are definitely much more accurate. They're a bit snappier. I mean, it's I, I, it wouldn't surprise me because you you get on a motorbike that's fucking brand new and they're a bit they're lucky they're responsive they're punchier. 
yeah. on a motorbike that's 10 years old and it's you gotta fucking give it a bit more um, yeah. Yeah. yeah shit wears out yeah um, yeah cool man dude anything, anything else you want to you want to go over anything else you want to mention anyone you you want to shout out it's been a it's been a good chat yeah no it's been it's been really good I was just going to say they haven't um, I don't think they've announced where Worlds is going to be next year but I assume it'll probably be in in Europe or America somewhere uh, late May, I think. Yeah, I saw a post um, from Alice Evans, who I, I did a highlight vid on the on the day for. Um, she said that she'd qualified for it, or like for HCAT, and yeah. she said we find out where it is on September 1st. September 1st. So I think we're a couple of days out from, a, from an, a, an announcement. I think that's Thursday or Friday. I don't know. I don't actually know what day it is today. So, yeah, um, 29th it is today. Yeah. So what's that Thursday, Friday? Yeah. So we should know. We should know pretty soon. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think they've all been in Europe. Have, have they not up to this point? I think there was one in Vegas. Vegas oh, yeah? Or... yeah, I reckon there's one in Vegas. Yeah. Man, I've I've only loosely followed it. Like I've I haven't really been across it um, too much. Um, their footage have you seen their footage from the Elite 15 last year they've really they've really stepped it up um, oh yeah com- yeah compared to the year before they had cameras at all the different stations and fuck yeah um, it was like a grid format so each athlete like just all your equipment was in one lane and it'd just go up like up up and back in the one mm-hmm. lane yeah it was it was really good um, to watch so I think we're going to do that with how do you mean? Uh, so there was so there was fifteen athletes, and they had fifteen lanes that mm-hmm. were. Um, let's say the lanes were about twenty meters or twenty five meters long. Do you know where I'd find it? Yeah, so just look up um, Horrocks Horrocks World Championships Elite Fifteen race on YouTube. Hi, YouTube. Give me a sec. Let's see if we can find this. Mm. Pyros. Yes, World Champs 2023. Yeah, so they're going to do that at all the, um, race. the regional events now as well. Oh, sorry, dude. That got very loud in my ear. What What were you saying? Yeah, so they're going to do the grid the grid format at all the regional events. So I think they've got four regional events this year and the World Championships, and they'll have it that format for each event. Which yeah. would just be good, just be good for spectators to to see more of the event. Fuck yeah, these dudes are animals. Yeah. Just oh, out there. yeah, I get I get what you're saying. Yeah, so they yeah, just move. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So every and time they're off running. They'll just pull the ski erg out of the way, put the sled there, attach the rope. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, they won't even attach the rope until the next station. Yeah, right. That's fucking cool. But I mean, then it's you can't do that with volume, right? You can only do that for the no. world champs. It's like you can yeah. set the CrossFit games up like that, but you can't do like the open. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, right. I haven't actually watched this. I should. Yeah, you you love it. Might learn some things about presenting. Um, I think um, I think Horrox Australia did really a really good job at Sydney and Melbourne for their first first events in Australia. It was yeah, um, fuck yeah. It ran like really smoothly. Yeah, dude. Like if if the, uh, I and I think I said that in my race report in Sydney. If they fucked up anything, I don't think anyone noticed. Like nah. there was no um, you know that every ra- every wave was on time. There was no tech glitches. Like. It all just it all just fucking worked the way it should have. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is cool. I like how they've done this. And then this this is a spectator sport. That's all this is. Yeah. Um, that's right. Look at the stadium. Yeah. That's cool. Up. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Sweet. I'm gonna watch that later. Thank you, sir. Yeah. No worries. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, it's they did do really well. And Matt Locke, he's the you know he started the Bay Games, so you know he's got a got an idea of what he's doing. Um, he's a really good guy. Um, 
really nice guy. I enjoyed chatting with him. So, you know, it seems like they've got a pretty good team. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they'll do well. Yeah, no. Pretty excited for what the next few years bring um, the sport in Australia. Be good. Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah. All right, buddy. Um, Mon saying they would change the stations while they were running. Yeah. Um, she worked it out quicker than I did. Um, yeah. Cheers, dude. Cheers for coming on. Cheers for the chat. I'll uh, I'll put this up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, yeah. And yeah, dude. Always always happy to bounce ideas if you want to chat about training or anything else. Uh, if there's anything exciting going on, flick me a message. Let me know. Nah, no, appreciate we'll, it, mate. Uh, Thanks. We'll see you around soon, buddy. Yeah. No worries. Stick yes. around for a minute. As soon as I finish this uh, video, guys, I'll um, I'll chat with you, Tom, on the back end for a sec. But um, yeah. thanks for tuning in, guys. Cheers for joining us. I will see what I can do to get uh, some other guys from Hyrox on um, in the next couple of days. So just stay tuned. And there there is still a couple of highlight videos and a race report for Hyrox Melbourne coming out tomorrow. It's almost completely done, so I'll probably watch that. I don't know, maybe like 5 p.m. tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. See you guys.